represent a Norwegian taboo that, um, that I got pretty familiar with a couple of months ago. Uh, when I was asked to give this TED talk, I read the TED guidelines, you know, because we are not told, we are not given any certain topic. We, we can talk about whatever we want, and that's, you know, that's the worst thing. What am I going to talk about? Am I going to talk about my research, my postdoc? What, what am I going to talk about? But then I read the TED guidelines, and they said that we are looking for speakers to share deep, intimate narratives. So that's what you get from me. You get an intimate narrative. I don't know how deep I am able to get because the clock is running over there, but I will get as deep as I can get. So uh, I'm going to share a personal story with you. And some of you might know it, some of you might recognize it, because this, my story was on na national Norwegian news three days in a row from the 10th of June till, I think, 12th of June. And you're going to get my version of it. I'm a feminist, like I told you, and I think personal is political. My story is personal, but it's also political. It's not political merely because it's personal. I think it would be political anyway. And even though it's personal, I think it tells quite a lot about the Norwegian society. Uh, as, you can, as you can probably hear from my accent, at least when I speak Norwegian, I'm a native Finn. I come from Finland. I have been living in Norway well, pretty much permanently, but a bit back and forward since 2003. And I've always felt that I'm some sort of an outsider in the society. And, uh, and as an outsider, it's easier to see the blind spots, the taboos. Uh, so I'm going to reveal a Norwegian taboo. Uh, and I also think my story is about the Norwegian political correctness that I consider as a thread against the open democracy and the discussion in it. So this is the taboo, I think. We are all alike. We are all the same. And we should all be treated in the same way. You know, behind there is this deep egalitarian Norwegian tradition. We go to the same schools, we sit in the same classrooms, no matter how talented we are or no matter how handicapped we are. This is the dominant and almost unquestionable ideology in egalitarian Norway. Uh, this ideology is so dominant that I think that we are treated in the very same way, even though it doesn't necessarily serve uh, his or her or my or yours, your individual needs. I got in the middle of this taboo in this school. I got into it very surprisingly and very involuntarily. This is a small school in my Norwegian hometown, Lillehammer. Lillehammer has something like 23, 24,000 inhabitants, and this school has 180 pupils. I was visiting this school in May as a sc local school board member. I'm a former liberal politician in this tiny political party called Venstre. And I was there, our, uh, our school board in the city council, we had a meeting at this school. And we were also supposed, uh, supposed to observe uh, the pilot project with iPads. There was a second grade, second grade class who had brand new iPads, and we politicians, we were supposed to see how they were doing with their new iPads. So we went to the classroom, and um, this is what I saw. This is my picture. This is the second grade. You see there's the teacher in the front, then you have the class, and then in the corner, the red spot, you have a boy. And this boy is surrounded by two assistants. They are probably his personal assistants, because this boy is handicapped. He has some really uh, strong uh, needs. I'm going to read the email I wrote to my party colleagues from this meeting. Because as a politician, I was, I'm the only politician representing the Liberal Party in the school board. So we had this practice that we wrote some sort of emails about what we saw and what we experienced. So I wrote this email to less than 10 party colleagues. We had an interesting session in the second grade. It was the pilot project with the iPads. The kids were really engaged. The teacher was skilled, and he had good educational ideas about the use of iPads. He considered iPad as a tool, as it is supposed to be. What made me angry was the special needs pupil in the corner. He had Down syndrome and autism. He sat in the corner with two assistants. 
One of them helped him uh, with his iPad program. The other one tried to calm him down because he was making noise. While he was doing some sort of cow, sheep, horse stuff on the iPad, I didn't really hear that well what the rest of the class was doing because I was behind this boy. My concern is this. This boy had no educational or academic advantage of sitting in this classroom during this class, or the other way around. On the contrary, he sitting there disturbed the class, and purely economically speaking, maybe one assistant had been enough if, it, if he had not been in the classroom. I know inclusion is a dominant ideology, but it can't be that pupils with heavy needs are used as tools so that the so-called normal pupils can broaden their minds and ideas of what is normal. That makes his, present in the classroom, his presence in the classroom merely instrumental. It doesn't benefit him academically. I know this is stuff you are not supposed to say in this country, where everyone learns everything and all the people are friends with each other. I think that inclusive education has to serve an educational and academic purpose. And ta-da, breaking the news. I'm the monster. <laughs> I sent this email to less than 10 party colleagues. One of them has a handicapped son. And he has also a son-in-law who works in the national broadcasting company. So this is what, uh, what happened. Uh, the sensation was me wanting to take away this poor kid from the corner, from the classroom. This is how it came out. Wants to remove a pupil with Down syndrome out of the classroom. And you know, a sensation sells. This sort of headline creates lots of click clicks on the internet. Uh, and this is much better headline than, like, let's say, what I would have preferred, once better inclusion for the boy in the corner, or once better learning for the boy in the corner. But you know, Down syndrome, it sells. It's something, it creates sympathy. Like in the headline, they say he had Down syndrome. It's more important that he had autism too, because you know Down syndrome people, they are so cute, and we should take good care of them. And that's, I'm not claiming that we shouldn't. Uh, I was, as I told you, three days in a row on national news because of this, and I think it's because I had questioned two big taboos in Norway. I had questioned if it was good for the kid to sit in the classroom, do his stuff, while the rest of the class was doing their stuff. But even worse, I was questioning if it was good for the rest of the class to have this kid sitting there as an instrument, so they would broaden their minds and they would feel that they are part of this kind and tolerant nation. So all this created headlines like this. May create wrong attitudes. Um, I. I felt during these three days, I really felt the hatred of the Norwegian nation on me. I got tons of hate emails, telephone calls, Facebook messages. I, I had known that this theme is sensitive, but I hadn't ever guessed that it would create so much hatred and resistance instead of true discussion on the themes that I took up in my email. I, of course, I didn't enjoy any of this. Um, I felt that uh, somebody, first of all, had stolen something that wasn't meant for the whole nation. One of my colleagues had done something that I didn't like. That's the one thing. And the other thing is what made this stuff pretty heavy to me was that the principal of this boy's school, he said on national news the 10th of June, that he, that he questioned my view of people with special needs. He questioned my humanity. And there were several other instances, several other, um, other people who followed up questioning my humanity, my values as a human being. Uh, I didn't recognize myself because my concern had been the opposite. I wanted the best for the boy and I wanted the best for the class. Did we really help the boy? or the boys like him, girls like him, by placing them in the classrooms, integrating them physically. They are physically there, but are they mentally there? So that had been my true concern. Or do we just want to show our own good goodness as a nation? So the headlines continued, the fuss continued. This is the organization, um, the, uh, the National Disability Rights Organization. 
I was a politician Norway doesn't need. Uh, so all this made me to resign as a politician. Now I'm done with politics, and I'm really done. Uh, not because I regret, not because I regret anything of what I wrote and said, not because I felt or feel that I was wrong. Uh, it's more like that I couldn't take this shit. I got so much shit during these days that I was like, no, I'm not going to have any more of it. I couldn't take this, I didn't want it, and I didn't deserve it. Uh, I, th I thought myself, I still think that I posed some pretty obvious questions. Why can't they be posed? Uh, so, <laughs> am I a politician Norway doesn't need, or what I felt inside, I'm a politician Norway doesn't deserve? <laughs> I had been... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, you know, as a, as a feminist, as a foreigner, uh, I had had unpopular views before. I had known how it is to be unpopular, but I had never been so unpopular, and I think unpopularity here was pretty tough, because, as I told you, it was about my humanity, and that I felt strongly in me. Nobody had ever questioned and doubted my humanity the way they did in this scandal. Um, I'm a former academic scholar, and my, I did my academic career on... Uh, well, most of my methods were... Um, the method I used mostly was discourse analysis. So I want to lift this debate up on a more academic level. Um, discourse is about a way of talking about things. And some discourses, when we talk about certain themes, certain things, some discourses get more dominant, more hegemonic than others. And on a meta level, on a more academic level, I think I challenged uh, the dominant, the hegemonic discourse on kids with special needs. Um, I also challenged, challenged the national discourse in this case, and I, in a way, I think I heard this national self-image of being a kind and tolerant nation. Um, I think I also challenged the strong egalitarian traditions. And I challenged, you know, Norwegian people, they have this idea that they are so good. Uh, and I think, I, and I, I sometimes get pissed off because they think they are so damn good. But they are, <laughs> they are, just, they are just good on the outside, <laughs> I think. Um, and so my questions, um, yeah, uh, my observations, they were extremely politically uh, incorrect. And um, my questions are, in a way, like, who can pose these questions if not to politicians? And where can they be posed if not in an open, liberal democracy? I think the only... Um, I think I could have posed these questions without the hatred if I had had a handicapped son or handicapped daughter myself. That would have given me the legitimacy. But since I was only a politician, I didn't have the legitimacy. Um, so I didn't have the authority to pose these questions. Uh, still on a more academic level, on a more academic level, I am inspired. There's this Slovenian philosopher called Slavoj Cizek, and I'm inspired by his thoughts on political correctness. He has said that political correctness is a totalitarian regime. Uh, if, you, um, if you Google political correctness, you get this Wikipedia um, definition. It's an attitude, attitude or policy of being careful not to offend or upset any group of people in society who are believed to have or to have had a disadvantage. Uh, Slavoj Cizek thinks that Political correctness is a tacit and dangerous form of totalitarianism. totalitarianism. It doesn't only tell you what to do, it also tells you how you should feel about it. Like this poor boy in Winger School, this cute boy. We are supposed to feel pity for him. He is, he is nice and he is cute, and I'm the monster who wants to remove him from his friends. Sometimes... This is such a beautiful concept. Norwegian people, they love the concept of freedom of speech. I sometimes wonder if the, the biggest problem with freedom of speech in Norway is that you are only allowed to say to politically correct. Otherwise, you get, yeah, you get 
murdered. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm alive again. Um, I want to um, end up with these words. Bill Maher is, um, is an American stand-up comedian and, and a TV host. He had this TV, TV show, late-night talk show called Politically Incorrect. And he says, we need more people speaking out. This country is not overrun with rebels and free thinkers. It's overrun with sheep and conformists. So, if we want to redefine the impossible, I think we need the rebels. So, I hope you choose to be one. Thank you.